President. Senator from Kentucky. Today, the Senate will vote on a bill that will add $1.5 trillion to the debt over the next 10 years. This is a large amount of money and something that we should be very wary of. This is in addition to what we were already running debt of, of nearly a trillion dollars. So we're adding a couple hundred extra billion dollars a year to a budget and a country and a Congress that had already recklessly let spending get out of control. The bill is nearly 700 pages. It was given to us at midnight last night, and I would venture to say no one has read the bill. No one can thoroughly digest a 700-page bill overnight, and I do think that it does things that we really, really ought to talk about and how we should pay for them. One of the things this bill does is it's going to add $500 billion in spending over a two-year period. This bill increases spending 21 percent. Does that sound like a large amount? Anybody at home getting a bonus or an increase in your paycheck of 21 percent? And yet your government's going to spend 21 percent more without really having a full debate, without having amendments. The exchange you just watched was me asking to have a 15-minute vote. I've been asking all day. I've been asking all week for it. We could have literally had dozens of votes today but we squabble because people don't want to be put on the spot. So the reason I'm here tonight is to put people on the spot. I want people to feel uncomfortable. I want them to have to answer people at home who said, how come you were against President Obama's deficits, and then how come you're for Republican deficits? Isn't that the very definition of intellectual dishonesty? If you were against President Obama's deficits and now you're for the Republican deficits, isn't that the very definition of hypocrisy? People need to be made aware. Your senators need to answer people from home and they need to answer this debate. We should have a full-throated debate. My amendment says this simply. We should obey the budget caps. What are budget caps? These are limits we placed on spending both military and non-military. We placed them in 2011, and guess what? For a year or two, government actually shrunk. But now government's taking off, and this new stimulus of deficit spending will be as big as President Obama's stimulus. Don't you remember when Republicans howled to high heaven that President Obama was spending us into the gutter, spending us into oblivion, and now Republicans are doing the same thing? And so I ask the question, whose fault is it? Republicans? Yes. Whose fault is it? Democrats? Yes, it's both parties' fault. You realize that this is the secret of Washington. The dirty little secret is the Republicans are loudly clamoring for more military spending, but they can't get it unless they give the Democrats welfare spending. So they raise all the spending. It's a compromise in the wrong direction. We should be compromising in the direction of going towards spending only what comes in. And yet this goes on and on and on. You will hear people say, well, the military is hollowed out. We have not enough money for our military. And yet we doubled the amount of money we spend on the military since 9-11-2001. Look, I have family members in the military. I have retired members of the military in my family, and I care very deeply about our soldiers. In fact, you know what I would do? I'd bring them all home from Afghanistan. The war is won. People are talking about making a parade. Declare victory in Afghanistan. Bring them home and have a parade and give them all a raise. And yet, we go on and on and on finding new wars to fight that make no sense, where we have no idea who the good guys are and who the bad guys are that are so murky that halfway through the war we sometimes change sides, or the people we support change sides. So we're at war in Afghanistan after 16 years. Costs $50 billion a year. So they need more money for the military because we're in too many places for too long. We have no exact mission of why we're there, and it is not a militarily winnable situation in Afghanistan. There will never be a victory in Afghanistan. There may be a negotiated settlement, and they may flee when we come, but as soon as we leave, they come back. Are we to be there forever? For the umpteenth time, Congress is going to exceed their budget caps. We had something passed back in 2010, it was called PAYGO. 
It was supposed to say if you're going to pay new money, you had to go find an offset somewhere else. You could only pay as you go. It was sort of like a family would think about it. If you're going to spend some more money, you either got to raise your income or you got to save some money. You know how many times we've evaded it since 2010? 30 some odd times. When I try to get them to pay attention to their own rules, like three or four people will vote to pay attention to the rules. We are in a terrible state as a country. $20 trillion in debt is bigger than our entire economy. You wonder why the stock market is jittery? Well, one of the reasons is we do not have the capacity to continue to fund a government like this. We've been funding it with phony interest rates that are concocted and given to us by the Federal Reserve, but they aren't real. What if interest rates become real again? Anybody remember when interest rates were 5, 10, 15? I remember as a teenager them being 19 or 20 percent. But historically they've often been at least 5. You know what happens to the government when our interest rate goes to 5 and they have to borrow for Social Security and Medicare and all the other stuff we do? There'll be a catastrophe in this country. Already interest rates are ticking up. Stock market is jittery. If you ask a question why? Maybe it has something to do with the irresponsibility of Congress spending money that we don't have. So the bill's going to exceed the budget caps by $296 billion. And that's not counting the money they don't count. All right, so these, these people are really, really clever. Imagine them running their fingers together and saying, how can we hide stuff from the American people? How can we evade the spending caps so we can be even more irresponsible than we appear? So 296 is the official number, about $300 billion over two years that will be in excess of the budget caps. But there's another $160 billion that's stuck into something called an overseas contingency fund. The budget caps don't apply there. So we're $300 billion for two years over the budget caps. And then we're another $160 billion over the caps, so they just don't count it. They act as if it doesn't matter. It's just We're just not going to count it. And then we come to catastrophes. And you might say to yourself, well, I have great sympathy for those people's houses were flooded in Texas and Florida. I do. My sister's house was flooded in, in, in Houston or near Houston. And so I have great compassion but even for my family, I can't take the money from you or borrow it for the next generation and just say, hey, here's a pot of money, go, go rebuild your house. We should do it in a responsible fashion. We've already, I think, spent 30 some odd billion on, on emergency relief for the hurricanes. There's another 90 billion. But you know what I've said? Instead of just plunking 90 billion down or actually printing it over at the Federal Reserve or borrowing it, instead of just doing that, why don't we take the 90 billion from somewhere in the budget that it shouldn't be? People come to me all the time, they want something from government. I say, well, if you want something from government, tell me where to take it from, because I'm not going to borrow anymore. We should take it from some other place in the budget. Where do you get the 90 billion from? So I've had some suggestions, and you know how many votes they get? About 10 or 15 people will vote with me. I say, well, you know what, let's not send it to Pakistan this year. They burn our flag, they put Christians in jail, they put the guy in jail, a Dr. Afridi, who helped us to find bin Laden. We finally got bin Laden. He'd been living high on the hog in the middle of a town, a mile or two from a military academy. Everybody probably knew he was there in the Pakistani government, and he lived uninterrupted. We finally got him when a guy named Dr. Shaquille Afridi gave us information. You know what Pakistan did to this doctor? He's in jail for 33 years. You know what they did with a Christian by the name of Asia Bibi? Pakistan has her on death row. She went to the well in a small village to draw water. And as she was drawing water, the women of the village began stoning her and beating her with sticks as she lay on the ground bleeding. And everybody watched and gawked as she lay on the ground bleeding. She was crying out for help when the police finally arrived and she thought she'd been saved only to be arrested for being a Christian. And yet, we've given $33 billion to Pakistan over the last decade. Good money after bad. Almost everybody up here loves it. They just want more of your money to go to Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, China, you name it. They'll send your money anywhere. And we've got a country that needs it here. Instead of nation building abroad, why don't we build our country here at home? Why don't we do some nation building here at home? So we have $90 billion that we need for, for emergency relief. 
Even as conservative as I am, I would say we can probably find that. We're a great rich country. We can probably rebuild, and the government can be part of that. But you know what? Why don't we quit sending it to Pakistan? Why don't we quit sending it to countries who burn our flag and chant death to America? Why don't we keep that money here at home? Why don't we say to the government writ large that they have to spend a little bit less? Anybody ever had less money this year than you had last? Anybody better have a 1% pay cut? You deal with it. That's what government needs, a 1% pay cut. If you take a 1% pay cut across the board, you have more than enough money to actually pay for the disaster relief. But nobody's going to do that because they're fiscally irresponsible. Who are they? Republicans. Who are they? Democrats. Who are they? Virtually the whole body is careless and reckless with your money. So the money will not be offset by cuts anywhere. The money will be added to the debt, and there will be a day of reckoning. What's the day of reckoning? The day of reckoning may well be the collapse of the stock market. The day of reckoning may be the collapse of the dollar. When it comes, I can't tell you exactly, but I can tell you it has happened repeatedly in history when countries ruin their currency, when countries become profligate spenders, when countries begin to believe that debt does not matter. That's what this bill is about. But here's the confusion. Some at home will say, we just want them to cooperate. If they would just hold hands and sing kumbaya, everything would be fine. Well, guess what? That's what you've got. You saw both of the leadership of both sides opposing me because they are now clasped hand in hand Everybody's getting what they want. Everybody's getting more spending. The military, the right's getting more military spending. The left is getting more welfare spending. And you're getting stuck with a bill. Not even technically you. It's the next generation being stuck with the bill. Your grandkids are being stuck with the bill. But mark my words, the stock market is jittery. The bond market is jittery. There is an undercurrent of unease amidst this euphoria you've seen in the stock market. A country cannot go on forever spending money this way. And what you're seeing is recklessness trying to be passed off as bipartisanship. So we've gotten together, they're all holding hands, and there's only one bad guy standing in the way. One guy's going to keep us here till 3 in the morning. Well, you know what? I think the country's worth a debate till 3 in the morning, frankly. I think it is worth a debate on whether or not we should borrow a million dollars a minute. I've been saying that for a few years. We borrow a million dollars a minute because I think it really brings it home. And we were talking about with my staff today, and they say, you know, it's almost two million a minute now. Two million dollars a minute. Can you imagine? And this is exploding. This deficit is exploding. And there really, there isn't the alarm you should see. But guess what? Every one of these people, you'll see them come home to your state. You'll see them come home and they'll tell you how earnest they are and how the deficit is bad and big government spending is bad and we have to reduce waste. It's dishonest. They're not doing anything about the waste. The waste has been out there for probably half a century or more. Nothing's been done in the last 40 years for one precise reason. There is no oversight. You realize what they are passing is all of the money glommed together in one bill. No one will read the bill no one knows what's in it, and there is no reform in the bill. That I can say with absolute certitude. No one will read it, no reform, nothing gets better, the debt will grow. When the Democrats are in power, Republicans appear to be the conservative party. But when Republicans are in power, it seems there is no conservative party. You see, opposition seems to bring people together and they know what they're not for, but then they get in power and they decide, hmm, we're just going to spend that money too. We're going to send that money to our friends this time. The hypocrisy hangs in the air and chokes anyone with a sense of decency or intellectual honesty. The right cries out, our military is hollowed out, even though military spending has more than doubled since 2001. The left is no better. Democrats don't oppose the military money as long as they can get some for themselves, as, they can, as long as they can get some for their pet causes. The dirty little secret is that by and large, both parties don't care about the debt. The spending bill is 700 pages, 
and there will be no amendments. The debate, although it's somewhat inside baseball that we're having here, is over me having a 15-minute debate. And they say, woe is me, if you get one, everybody will want an amendment. Well, guess that, that would be called debate. That would be called an open process. That would be called concern for your country, enough to take a few minutes. And they're like, but it's Thursday, and we like to be on vacation on Fridays. And so they, they clamor, but we've been sitting around all day. It's not like we've had 100 amendments today, and we're all worn out, we can't do one more. We're going to have zero amendments. Zero, goose egg, no amendments. So it's a binary choice. They love that word. It's a binary choice. Take it or leave it. Well, you know what? I'm going to leave it. I didn't come up here for this. I didn't leave my family throughout the week and travel up here to be a part of something that is so much inertia and so much status quo that they're not leading the country. They're just following along, and it's a big ball rolling down the hill, grabbing up your dollars as the boulder rolls down the hill, and it gets bigger and bigger, and it's going to crush us. But nobody's got the guts to stand up and say no. Over the past 40 years, only four times have we actually done 12 individual Department of Government appropriation bills. You've heard of like the Appropriation Committee. This is where the spending is. So you have like the Department of Defense, the Department of Commerce, Health and Human Services. We're supposed to pass each individual bill. And what would happen when we pass the bills, they would go through committee and each committee would look and see, well, this spending seems to be working. We're getting a great result and we want some more next year. And this spending appears to be, have been put in a closet and lit on fire, and so next year we're not giving that person who put the $10 million in the closet and lit it on fire, we're not going to give them any money. But guess what? That doesn't happen. So people keep putting your money in a closet and lighting it on fire. You've heard about FEMA. It's this emergency organization. You've heard about people without food. So there was like 300 million meals they needed, I believe, for Puerto Rico. 350 million meals. So you knew who got the contract? a person that had no employees. Now raise your hand, you're not allowed to actually, but let's say raise your hand in a figurative way if you think it's a good idea to give a contract for 350 million meals to someone who has no employees, who doesn't, who's not already in this business. They just know how to fill out the forms in the federal government to trick us into giving the contract. They were woefully short, and there are still people waiting in line for meals. So it's not even compassion or no compassion. It's idiocy versus more idiocy. We gave the money to somebody who doesn't do this. 350 million meals. So over the past 40 years, four times have we actually done the right thing. Passed 12 individual appropriation bills, bundled them together, have a budget, and try to do the right thing. You know, there's no guarantee that everybody will be wise in their spending, but it's got to be better. It can't be worse. What do we do instead? It's called a continuing resolution. We glom all the bills together in one bill, like we've done tonight, Republicans and Democrats clasping hands, and nobody's going to look at it. Nobody's going to reform the spending. As a consequence, wasteful spending is riddled throughout your government. Only four times in 40 years have we done the appropriation process the way we're supposed to. Recently, they did a Pentagon study. It's the beginning of an audit, and they audited a part of the Pentagon. This partial audit shows that $800 million was misplaced or lost. Just $800 million. I don't think they actually put it in a closet and burned it, but they can't find it. A while back, they looked at some of the military uh, expenditures, and they had $29 billion worth of stuff they couldn't find. Overall, the audit found that over $100 billion in waste was found at the Pentagon, $100 billion. Well, their budget's like $700 billion. So, you know, we're talking about a significant, over a 10%, you know, problem with figuring out waste. But it doesn't get any better because we don't vote on all these things individually, and we don't parse out the difference. I'll give you another example. The Department of Defense, last year, we found this out, spent $45 million dollars on a natural gas gas station in Afghanistan, $45 million. It was projected to cost $500,000. 86 some odd overruns, you know, of cost overruns, $45 million. So you're scratching your head and you're saying, natural gas gas station, what is that? We don't have one in my town. We don't have any in my town either. 
They didn't have any in Afghanistan, but you know what? They decided that they needed to reduce the carbon footprint of Afghanistan, all right? They wanted to reduce the carbon footprint of Afghanistan. I thought the military's job was to kill the enemy. So the military's job now is to reduce their carbon footprint? So they bought a $45 million gas station that serves up natural gas, and guess what they discovered? They kept waiting, so there's a guy sitting next to the pump. You can imagine him sitting on a stool, and he's waiting for customers. No one ever came. And then someone said, oh my goodness, they don't have any cars that run on natural gas. Well, that would probably be the same if you came to my town in Kentucky. Almost nobody's got a car in America. This, they live in a primitive state in Afghanistan, and you're expecting them to have natural gas cars? So they said, well, gosh, we already built this $45 million gas station. Maybe we should buy them some cars. So they bought them some cars with your money. They paid for the gas station with your money. Now they bought them some cars with your money. But then the people still wouldn't come in. They said, we don't have any money. And they said, okay, well, we've got the gas station. We've got your cars. You need a credit card. So we gave them credit cards. So they have a U.S. credit card that you pay for to take their natural gas car that you paid for to go to a natural gas gas station because we're reducing the carbon footprint in Afghanistan. When did that become the job of the military? And why does that go on year after year after year, the waste? For 17 years, we've been trying to get the Pentagon to be audited. And you know what their response has been? Hey, we're too big to be audited. How's that for your government? Your government telling you they're too big to be audited and that scrutiny's not, you know, that's just not your business. Is it any wonder, really? It surprises me sometimes it's not worse, but is it any wonder that our debt's a $20 trillion debt? So 50 years ago, William Proxmire was a senator. He was a Democrat senator, a conservative Democrat in some ways. He began handing out something called the Golden Fleece Award, and we'll talk about a few of them. So this is 50 years ago. And the reason I want to point this out is, as you look at this and listen, you'll find that some of the stuff we're doing today is just as bad as 50 years ago. Some of it's the same agencies. And so you scratch your head and you say, 50 years? We've been through a couple generations of politicians, and they're still not learning anything from finding this waste? Some of it's a budget process. The process that we pass these enormous bills that no one reads, that no one scrutinizes, and that do not reform the spending. So William Proxmire used to do this Golden Fleece Award, and I remember this as a kid in the early 70s. So here's a couple of things that he had pointed out. This is sort of uh, some of his best. So the National Science Foundation spent $84,000 trying to find out why people fall in love. Now, there sounds like a really worthwhile science project with a real specific answer. I think the conclusion was they're not exactly sure. The National Science Foundation, which you'll see is a recurring theme in bad and wasteful spending, also spent about $500,000 to try to determine why rats, monkeys, and humans bite and why they clench their jaw. Well, now you could say, oh, well, that's really important. Maybe we'll discover something from that. Or you could say, when we're running a deficit and we're borrowing the money, that maybe some of these things may or maybe not be the most worthwhile to borrow the money for them. This is a good one. This is from the early 70s. Federal Aviation Administration spent $57,000 studying the body measurements of what they called in those days airline stewardesses. These were trainees, and these were for the purpose of purchasing their safety equipment. But somebody got $50,000 to measure the body measurements of airline stewardesses. Administrators of the Federal Energy Administration, this is still from William Proxmire 50 years ago, spent millions of dollars to find out if drunk fish are more aggressive than sober fish. I'm not going to tell you the answer. I'm going to let you ponder that one. Do you think drunk fish are more aggressive than sober fish? This is your government. This is your money. And this is the debt you're handing on to your kids and grandkids. And this is 50 years ago. So now we'll get into some of the things that we've been doing more recently. We do a waste report where we point some of these things out. And uh, every week we have a new one. And so if you want to look at our waste report, we've got that up, uh, I believe, on our Facebook and on our website. So this is one of my favorites. You remember when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon? He said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Or some people think he said, one small step for a man, one giant leap. So there's been some discussion 
some very heated discussion of what he said, one step for man or one step for a man. The preposition A, did he or did he not use the preposition A? So your government, in their infinite wisdom, took $700,000, which by the way was supposed to go to autism research, and they decided to study Neil Armstrong's statement. So somebody at some university decided to play the tape over and over to see what he said. $700,000 later, they couldn't decide. They just, you know, inquiring minds want to know, but that we just still don't know. Did he say a man or did he say man? So this is the same kind of stuff you were seeing with William Proxmire 50 years ago, but this is last year. I think it's the same group, National Science Foundation. I think I'm probably going to get some hate mail from them. So this is um, $850,000, and we call this one the game of waste. This was spent, and you, you know, you think when we're spending money in Afghanistan, well, surely it's uh, to kill the enemy. Sometimes it's building bridges, sometimes it's building roads, stuff that, you know, we don't do in our country anymore. But this one was $850,000 for the development of a televised cricket league. You see, self-esteem is important, and we want the Afghanis to feel good about themselves. We want them to be able to watch the national sport on TV. So we spent $850,000 to get it televised. The only thing we didn't reckon is that it was kind of like the natural gas cars. They didn't have TVs. So I don't know if we're in the process now of buying them TVs, but we did spend $850,000 of your money to get a televised cricket league for those people in Afghanistan. We'll do the next one. So this is a good one. Everybody likes to take a selfie, right? Everybody's had it. If you don't do them, your kids will do them with them, your grandkids will do them with them. This was a study of $500,000 to tell if taking selfies makes you happy. Whether you're smiling or you're frowning and you look at yourself in the picture, does it make you happy? Now, you know, inquiring minds want to know. And if you want to study that, good for you. Go get somebody to voluntarily give you some money to study that, all right? And I, I really would like to watch you going around the neighborhood, knocking on doors, asking for money to study whether selfies make you happy, okay? This stuff has been going on for 40 years. Why don't we root this out and stop it? Well, one, they'll come to you all high and mighty and they'll say, but sir, it is science and you are just a lay person and don't understand how important selfies could be and you aren't qualified to talk about selfies because you don't know about happiness. We have experts in happiness that can tell that we could make the world happy again. We could all be happy if we had more selfies. And so it goes on. They give us this scientific mumbo jumbo that somehow we're not smart enough to have common sense enough to know what we should be spending money on. But this goes on decade after decade. It's a school lunch program. And you might say, well, you know, we need to help those who can't buy school lunch. So we have a school lunch program. Except for what we discovered was $158 million was given, federal money, to a Los Angeles school district. And it turns out they were buying things other than lunches because nobody was watching them. Nobody was auditing the program. Nobody was doing the individual appropriation bills. They were passing class pans together, continuing resolutions where nobody looks at it. 700 pages and nobody reads it. And when nobody reads it, they buy sprinklers and buy things for themselves, new televisions for the faculty to watch. $158 million that was not spent on school lunches but was wasted and spent on other items. <clears throat> So everybody's heard about climate change, and there's some undertones and overtones of politics in, in, in climate change, but in case you haven't heard of climate change, the people who want you to hear of climate change want to spend some of your money to make sure you're listening to them about climate change. So they spent $450,000 on a video game. This is also National Science Foundation. So a whole new generation will be able to play this video game on climate change, and uh, you know, complete with great uh, graphics, and we've got this game that your kids can play on, on climate change. And it's like, it's, it's just one thing after another. <clears throat> All right, you may be, have been on this one if you're in Washington. This one we call a streetcar named Waste. There's a streetcar 
over here a few blocks on H Street and they spent $1.6 million on it. I think they had already spent more on it before that, but they spent an additional, it goes a mile. It goes from nowhere to nowhere. And you get on and there's nobody on it. And it's just cost a fortune. You could walk from one end to the other in about the same time it takes you to go on the subway or on this, on this uh, trailway, tramway. And so, but, you know, $1.6 million. And you have to ask yourself when you see this government spending, would you, do, would you give money to this? And I ask this question often when I'm home. I ask people, if you had $100 you were going to give because you wanted to help people, would you give it to the Salvation Army or the federal government that spends $1.6 million on a streetcar that goes from nowhere to nowhere and no one rides? So I talked about whether or not we should be spending the money somewhere else or here. This is $250,000 that was spent on bringing 24 kids from Pakistan to space camp and to Dollywood. And you can say, well, that's good relations. Now we're going to have good relations with Pakistan. They're no longer going to kill Christians, put them in jail, or burn our flag. Maybe. And I'm not against interaction. And in fact, if this were uh, some kind of privately funded group that wanted to have some money to have interaction between us and Pakistan, I'd probably be all for it. But first, the price tag's a little scary to me, $250,000 for 24 kids. But then I also think, I, I represent a lot of people in Kentucky who don't have the money to drive down to Huntsville and go to space camp with their kids. So really, should we not sort of readjust our priorities and start thinking, you know, do we need to take care of ours at home here before we start shipping our money overseas? Or do we really need to think about, can we afford to just keep borrowing money for projects like this? This is the Department of Defense, and this I think we referred to earlier. And this was the $29 million worth of heavy equipment that they lost. Can't find it in Afghanistan. It's even worse than that. See, they lost that, but we also made the decision as we were downgrading the war in Afghanistan after the last surge that we did in Afghanistan that we didn't want the other side to have our stuff, so we blew up a lot of our own stuff. We blew up billions of dollars worth of Humvees, tanks, you name it. But they, when they were looking and counting it up, they found $29 million worth that they couldn't find. But this is, if, if you really think about it, and you're thinking, how could we have more money for both our national defense, and how could we have more money for, like, infrastructure? You hear people talk about infrastructure. People want to build roads. Republicans and Democrats want to build roads. But guess what? There's no money. We're a trillion dollars short this year because we passed these class pans, spend whatever the hell you can find, whatever's not tied down, spend it and give it away. Both sides spend it, you know, there's no tomorrow. But if you say, how could we change our government? Where would there be some money that we could actually save? Well, really, some of it is in our foreign policy. We do not have enough, probably, for our military to be involved in seven wars. We might have enough to be involved in maybe three or two or one, or maybe we should not be involved in any of the ones we're involved at this point. You know, the thing is, we said after 9-11, we're going to go after those who attacked us, those who aided the attackers, and those who abetted them or supported them. They're all dead. We killed them all. And that's good. We should declare victory and come home from Afghanistan. Because right now, we're over there nation building. Why, why do we have trouble with nation building? I'll give you a, a story from a Navy SEAL I met a couple years ago. He'd been in 19 years. He was a tough guy, like they all are. And he said, you know what? We can go anywhere, we can kill any of our enemies, we can do whatever you ask us to do. But he said the mistake is when the politicians tell us to plant the flag and create a country. We're just not very good at it. Most of our military don't want to be policemen, they don't want to create countries. They'd soon kill the enemy, come back home to their family. But we kill the enemy and then we stay and we stay and we stay and we build them schools, we build them roads. I mean, there are some schools that have been built four or five times and blown up four or five times by the Taliban. It's terrible that the Taliban doesn't want girls to go to school. It's terrible that the Taliban would do this. But don't the people who live there have some responsibility after we've given them a trillion dollars to do something for themselves? And will people do something for themselves if you keep doing it for them? So really, there has to come a time when we come home. We spend $50 billion a year in Afghanistan. Our mission's over and we should come home. It's $50 billion a year that could be spent on infrastructure if you wanted to do that, or in maybe not having a trillion dollar debt next year, or deficit next year. We're in a bunch of different places, though. When the soldiers were killed in Niger not too long ago, or Niger, 
uh, a country in Africa. Many people didn't even know where the country was, much less that we had 800 troops there. You say, well, it's only 800. It's not that many. Well, the problem is 800 sometimes becomes 8,000 and sometimes then becomes 80,000 because we get in the middle of a civil war and some of our guys get killed. We're like, well, gosh, we've got to do more, not less. And nobody wants to come home after people have been killed. They want to go in and punish the enemy. But I don't know who the good people are in Niger, who the bad people are and what they're fighting about. And so I think sometimes it's very unclear who the good guys and bad guys are. We've been involved in the Syrian civil war for a long time, and we aided a group of people that many up here called the moderate Syrian rebels. Well, it turns out the moderate Syrian rebels were jihadist often. They hated Israel. The only people they didn't hate, hated about as much as Israel was us. We gave anti-tank weapons to one group, and the leader of the group, within a week of getting our anti-tank weapons, said, you know, we want them to fight ISIS. They said, the hell with ISIS. We want to attack Assad. When we're done with Assad, we want to attack Israel and get the Golan Heights back. These are the people we're giving weapons to. We poured hundreds of tons of weapons in there with Qatar, a lot of our weapons and a lot of our dollars running through Qatar, you know, running through uh, United Arab Emirates, running through Saudi Arabia, just pour it in there. But a lot of them wound up in the wrong hands. We kept supporting these moderate fighters that didn't fight. We spent $250 million training 10 of them. We trained 10 fighters for $250 million. We sent them into battle and they were captured in the first 30 minutes. But then guess what happened recently? And I will give President Trump some credit for this. They decided to ally with whoever was fighting the best over there, and it turned out the Kurds were, both the Syrian Kurds and the, the Kurds that live in Iraq, and they did fight. But now, you know, the question is, oh, now Turkey's unhappy with that, so we're going to throw the Kurds under the bus in favor of Turkey that has a leader that really has no use for us at this point either. It's very, very confusing who the enemy is and who our friends are over there. But it's also very, very expensive. I think we have to defend ourselves, and we may occasionally have to attack the enemy overseas. But the thing is, is if we go and stay for decade after decade, you know, in Iraq, they said, oh, we didn't stay long enough. How long's long enough? A hundred years, 200 years, forever? They don't see us, you know, we said they're gonna treat us as liberators. They, they kind of see us as occupiers. Afghanistan has hated every country that's ever come in there. They didn't like the Russians occupying them. They didn't like the British occupying them. They don't like us there. There was a movie with a depiction of uh, this scene and not too long ago, and they were in a village, and they just freed the village, and the general was telling them how you are free, you are free, or you're free, and the elders of the village gathered and said, will you leave now? Because they realized that wasn't the end, and that eventually the Americans would leave when they left, the Taliban would come back. And uh, we just have to rethink, are we going to be at war forever? Can we afford it? And maybe do we have to think about maybe whether or not we should do some nation building here at home and not always abroad? We have to think about the unintended consequences of what we do as well. And I'll give you an example of that. We give, you know, we just recently signed a deal to give Saudi Arabia over $350 billion worth of uh, military equipment. Currently, Saudi Arabia is using that equipment to encircle and blockade a country next to them, Yemen. Yemen's a very poor country. They import about 80% of their food. They're one of the poorest countries on the planet, and currently 17 million people live on the edge of starvation. But people have convinced themselves that, well, there's some Shia that are supported by Iran, and we don't want Iran there, so we've got to support the Sunnis. Does anybody remember who attacked us on 9-11? One of the Shias, it was the Sunnis. Most of the radical jihadists and the ones that have been trying to get into our country, in fact, I don't know of any Shia terrorists that have been here, to tell you the truth. We've had plenty of Sunni terrorists. All the, 16 out of the 19 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia. We just released documents last year, the missing pages from the Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia investigation with 9-11 Commission that shows that there's a possibility they were complicit in those things. They're not exactly a free country. They're a monarchy that is actually con having power consume and consume and concentrate in one person's hands more and more. So we have to decide what wars do we need to be involved in. Our founders were very clear about this. Our founders didn't like war, by the way. Our founders had seen virtually perpetual war in Europe. Everybody was always fighting somebody and went on even after the founding of our country. Cousins were fighting cousins, fathers fighting brothers, brothers fighting brothers. Everybody was related. All the royal families of Europe were related. They're always fighting with each other. Of course, they didn't do the fighting. They sent the common man to do the fighting. So when we got to our country, we said, we've got these oceans, enough of that. We want less war. So one of the things they included in the Constitution was this. 
they included in the Constitution a very specific provision that said when we go to war, we have to declare war. It has to be passed by Congress. So there was a debate over whether that power should be in Congress or should be in the hands of the president. And Madison said this. He said that the executive, the president, is the branch most prone to war. Therefore, with studied care, we gave that power to the legislature. So war is supposed to be determined by us and ultimately us as representatives of you. It doesn't happen that way, and it hasn't happened that way for a long time. Why are we at war in seven different places? We don't vote on it. We haven't voted on anything really since the proclamation for the Iraq War, which I think was a mistake, but we at least voted on it back in 2002. We voted in 2001 to go into Afghanistan for those who attacked us. We haven't voted on anything since. They say, oh, the 2001 proclamation gives us the power to go anywhere. Because these people could somehow tangentially, the pe most, people, most of the people we're fighting now weren't even born and have nothing to do with 9-11 and nothing to do with Afghanistan. And yet we're in perpetual war and we haven't voted on it. So once again, it's the process that's broken, like the budget. So we have extraordinary waste and your money gets burned and put in a closet and thrown down a waste hole because we don't do the right process of following your money. And war is somewhat the same way. We get involved in war in too many places because we don't have a vigorous debate. When we go to war, I tell people that should be the most important decision we ever make, most important decision a legislator ever makes. It should be a profound, moral, personal decision as if your kids are going or as if you are going. And it should be a heartfelt debate and everybody should, should speak out. We should try to figure out whether it's right to go to war. And interestingly, when we've been attacked, we've been nearly unanimous. When we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, they voted, and I think one person opposed it in Congress, and everybody else voted for it. When we were attacked at, uh, on 9-11, same thing. And I would have voted for that response. We should have responded. It was the right thing. But we voted. We did the right thing. But since then, we're now at war everywhere in countries that most of us haven't heard of, fighting on one side or the other. We don't even know what we're fighting for, and it costs an extraordinary amount of money, but we're not voting on it. Maybe if we did the right thing. Maybe if, like appropriations, we passed the appropriation bills. Maybe if war, we voted on it, we wouldn't be in so many places. But they're all interconnected because they're interconnected to the shortness that we have in money. The last thing I'll get to is something called the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling is something that has been a limitation on how much we spend. And we have to vote on it, and it's an unpleasant vote. And so they try to either do it for a long period of time or try to stretch it beyond elections. So this bill, the 700-page bill that no one read, that will continue all the spending and will not reform your government and is irresponsible, the one we will pass later tonight, that 700-page bill also uh, allows the debt ceiling to go up. Historically, we would let the debt ceiling, our borrowing limit, we would let it go up a dollar amount. We'd say, well, we've got to borrow money, and it looks like we're going to need a trillion dollars. But you know the way they do it now? It's like everything else around here. We bend, break the rules, and then uh, th somehow there's a little bit of deviousness to it. The debt ceiling will go up in un uh, un unspecified amount. So as much as you can borrow between now and, and November, go for it. So there is no limitation. The debt ceiling becomes not a limitation at all. They're still taking the vote, although many people don't even want to vote on anymore. They just want it just to happen. They say, well, you voted for the spending. I personally think the more obstacles we have in place to spending money you don't have, the better we would be. But uh, the debt ceiling will go up in an unspecified amount. There will be a credit card uh, that will be issued for the United States that has no limits. And this is a problem. So everything about this stinks, to tell you the truth. Everything about this process, and the media doesn't even get it. The media does you such a disservice. They can't even understand what's going on sometimes. They're like, bipartisanship is broken out. Hallelujah, Republicans and Democrats are, are getting along, and in reality, they should be telling you, look for your wallet, check your pants to make sure they haven't taken your wallet. Because when both parties are happy, and both parties are getting together and doing stuff, guess what? They're usually looting the Treasury. And that's what this bill does. It's going to loot the Treasury. It spends money we don't have. We will have a trillion dollar deficit this year. A trillion dollars. And what I would say to my Republican colleagues, you don't see them here, I'm not sure where they are, but what I would say to my Republican colleagues is, I know every one of you, I know every one of you, I've seen your speeches, I saw every one of you go after President Obama. Was that all just empty partisanship? Do you not really believe it? 
Every one of them in their states, I promise you, every one of them went home and probably will go home next week and say how they're fiscally conservative and they're against the debt, and almost all of them are going to vote for this new debt. Almost all of them are going to vote for a trillion dollar debt in one year, and every one of the Republicans, at least, was against President Obama's debt. At least the Democrats are honest. They're not too concerned about the debt. Well, they are sometimes. They're concerned about the debt when it comes to taxes because they don't want people to keep more of their own money. They are afraid somehow of the imbalance of that. But the thing is, is that we do have to watch the balance of money, how much comes in and goes out. And some have said, well, how can you be a deficit hawk if you voted for the tax cut? Well, one, because I think you own your, your, your labor. You own the fruits of your labor. You own all of it. You give up some of your labor to live in a civilized world. And so my question to you is that everything you make, everything you own, everything that comes from the sweat of your brow and the work of your hands is yours. And if you give up some, you're giving up your liberty. And you give up a little bit of your liberty, you give up a little bit of your wages to live in a civilized world, to have law, to have law and order, and have some government. So I'm okay with that. But I ask you, do you want to give up more or less? Do you want to give up 100% of your paycheck? Or do you want to give up 10% of your paycheck? We should always be about minimizing government. So taxes really are about how much of your liberty you get to keep, how much of the liberty to continue spending your own money. And the other side of the ledger is the spending. Are we going to have some government spending? Yes. The Constitution laid out very specific requirements for what was allowed to do. Article 1, Section 8 says what Congress can do, and they're very few and limited. And yet what happened over time is that we began doing a lot of things that aren't there. What they said in the Bill of Rights was pretty important, though, in the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. The Ninth Amendment says that those rights not listed are still yours and not to be disparaged. So the Bill of Rights was not a complete listing of your rights. You have many other rights, such as the right to privacy, the right to property, that aren't exactly spelled out in the first eight amendments. But then the Tenth Amendment said something really important, too. They said if the Constitution didn't explicitly give that power to the federal government, it's left to the states and the people, respectively. So many of the things we do up here, and this is the other reason for our debt, there are checks and balances within the process. We're supposed to do appropriation bills and all that. That might or might not work. It, would be, it can't be worse than what we're doing now. But the real check and balance is the Constitution. So the Constitution has these limits on how big government can get and what government can do. And if we obeyed the Constitution, you would have a balanced budget every year. If you had a balanced budget every year, would there still be things that government does? Sure. But we have to assess as a people, we have to decide, and really this is the ultimate decision the American people have to have. Are you going to cheer for the Republicans and Democrats holding hands and having a trillion dollar deficit, or are you going to say to yourself, hmm, I'm suspicious that the Republicans and Democrats are clasping hands and giving us a trillion dollar deficit. Is it a good thing? Are we so excited about civility that we don't care what the result of civility is? Or are we really sort of misguided in thinking because people aren't yelling at each other and that they've bridged their differences, but that the compromise means that we're all going to spend more money, we're going to ignore the Constitution, the waste is going to continue on, and nothing will be fixed. Are we so sold on civility that we're willing to give up on and just say, oh, well, at least we're getting along together. As long as we're getting along, that's all we want. I think we're smarter than that. And I think the American people are more perceptive. And I think in the end, the American people will see through this. I think they're going to see it in the future as the future unfolds, as the stock market continues to be jittery. I think they're going to see it as we move forward and the ramifications of having so much debt come home. This could be higher interest rates. And those affect not only you personally, but can also affect the massive government programs that we have, Social Security and Medicare. The borrowing that we do for our interest is one of the larger items. I think it's the third largest item that we spend right now. And so as interest payments grow, it crowds out other things. And so right now we've got, you know, we're still paying government interest, probably the low twos, 2% 2 or a little bit more. Imagine what happens when it's 5%. Even if interest stays at 2%, because government is growing and we have a bigger and bigger debt, we're going to have an $800 billion uh, interest payment. It'll be the number one item. It's going to crowd out everything else. So there are ramifications. There are people who say that when you're at a hundred percent of your GDP, like your whole economy, when your whole economy equals your debt, 
that you're at this sort of precipice. You're at this point where you may reach a point of no return. There are ways we could fix this. Later this year, I'll offer a budget that freezes spending. And you say, well, how bad could that be? We're just going to give government the same amount they had last year. If you freeze all spending, everything, I mean everything that we spend money on, you balance the budget within about five or six years. And you'd, you'd, you'd get things back in balance if you did it. But if you talk to people up here, they would freak out. And I promise you, almost we'll probably get 10 or 15 votes for you know, freezing spending to try to get it back in order. But this is what we have to ask as American people. Are you happy with your government? Are you happy with trillion dollar deficits? Are you happy with people who just don't seem to, to care? They, ca they care somehow more about this uh, clasping hands and everybody gets everything and you get to get home for the weekend. Uh, but I think the ramifications for our country are severe and significant. And what I would ask my colleagues, as well as those across the country, is basically, what do you want from government? Is, do, you, do you want some physical item? Is government here so someone can get you something and give you some physical item, a cell phone or a car? Is that what government's for? Or is government here to preserve your liberty? See, most of us, or most, I would say some of us, believe that your rights are from God, that they pre-exist government, and that really government's job is not to get you stuff. Government's job is not to get somebody else's stuff for you. Government's job is to preserve your liberty, to preserve your natural God-given rights. And in doing that, you, you, you may acquire through your liberty and through your hard work, you may acquire stuff, and the government helps to prevent your neighbor from stealing it, but your government shouldn't be the one stealing it from your neighbor and giving it to you. And besides, we, we look at the ramifications of a society where we do think that we're going to take from one and give to the other, and we're going to do it through this government transfer program. When we look at that, we ask, is that good for the person? There's a good friend of mine who talks a lot about self-esteem, and I, I like the way he puts it. He says that self-esteem cannot be given to you. People say, well, you know, we need to have everybody get a trophy, everybody gets first place, and we need to, whether Johnny can read, we need to pat Johnny on the back and make sure Johnny feels good about whether he can read or not read. And in reality, the only self-esteem you get is from achievement. And some people say, oh, that's easy to say if you've achieved or done something, but really you can have achievement at anything. It's a little bit akin to some of this talk we've had about, you know, merit uh, immigration. You know, there's, there's merit to hard work, picking tomatoes. There's, uh, there's merit to being a doctor, a lawyer, a professor. There's merit to so many jobs. And that's also where your self-esteem comes from. And one of the things we've done in our country is we are destroying the self-esteem and motivation of the country. What goes along with that? When we've destroyed your self-esteem and you no longer leave your house, weight problems, drug problems, and all the things that ensue from that. And people say, oh, you're simplifying addiction. It doesn't all come from big government. Maybe, maybe not, but I think there's a correlation. There's a correlation to not working and the disease that comes from non-work. You say, oh, you're heartless. You're just saying that, that everybody should work and they're not jobs. There virtually are full employment, full employment now. We have less than 4% unemployment. And yet, the way we measure it, we still have communities that have 30% non-workers because they're no longer counted in this. And this is where a lot of the problem exists in our society. A lot of the drug problem is coming from non-workers. And so I think we have to reflect on what we want from government. Do you want something material from government? Do you want some government to give you something that your neighbor has that you don't have? Or do you want government to protect your God-given liberty? And I think if, if we realize that the abstraction of liberty is something amazing and incredible, and that's what our government is about, maybe we would bicker less. And we, we would become more unified as a people knowing that what you're trying to get is not something, you know, they talk about whether coveting something is a bad thing. You know, when you covet or you, you really want something of somebody else's. Some of it's because I was, it's somebody else's, but some of it's wrong about it, but some of it's because it's, it's a material thing you want instead of sort of the freedom, the, the freedom to search and seek out through work and through life and through art and through literature, your own bit of self-esteem. And I think if we knew what government was about and we recognized the true function of government, we wouldn't be in this state. But I can tell you that I'm very, very saddened by where we are. 
I'm saddened mostly by the debate on my side. I have disagreements with the other side, but I know where they are as far as these are concerned. I'm saddened on my side that many people who give lip service to believing and saying when they're at home they are fiscal conservatives will vote for a bill that adds a trillion dollars to the debt. And I think really, if we were honest with ourselves, we would say no. And people say, well, the, the government was shut down. I don't want the government to shut down. I'm not, I think it's a, it's a dumb idea. In fact, I proposed legislation called the Government Shutdown Protection Act. What my legislation would do is this. You have a year to do your appropriation bills. There's 12 different units of government, and you're, it's your job. That's what you're supposed to do. And we say, well, how do we make these people do their job if they won't do their job? So what we say is over that 12-month period, we say, well, if you don't do your job, government will continue spending, but government will continue spending 1% less. So government would go on spending 99% of what they spent the last year, but every 90 days would take 1% more from government until the people in government decide to do their job. I see some members of the House. They did their job last year. They passed all 12 appropriation bills. And yet the Senate, I think, we finally in the end passed one four or five months into the, into the fiscal year. So I think if you looked at it that way and you said, how can we do, how can we convince Congress to do its job? That's part of the answer is passing the individual appropriation bills, but also evaluating them for waste and being concerned with waste. But probably equally important is understanding that the, the function of government, the powers of government are, are few, defined, and limited. And, and that was a big thing that Madison talked about. And when you read the Federalist Papers, he's, he, the Federalist Papers, he's talking about how there are very specific functions of government. Government wasn't supposed to do everything. There's nothing in, in the Constitution about education. You say, oh my God, he would get the federal government out of the education system. Absolutely. Get them completely out. The Constitution said nothing about them being in, and we don't have the money for it, and the state governments are better at it. It doesn't say the state government can't be involved, but the federal government shouldn't be involved at all in education. We took on a responsibility that wasn't in the Constitution. We don't pay for it. And as a consequence, our government gets bigger and bigger. We take on new functions of government that really were never spelled out in the Constitution. Department of Commerce, it could be gone. You'd never know it, probably. But it could be gone. You save $35 billion in it. Most of its functions are not in the Constitution. But see, we have to have some of that debate over what is the proper role, what is the constitutional role, and how would we have that debate if we're not allowed to amend the bill, if we're given a 700-page bill the night before, nobody reads it, and they say, well, it's done. It's a binary choice, their favorite word, binary choice. Take it or leave it. Well, I'm leaving it. I'll have nothing to do with adding a trillion dollar debt. I could not go home and look my wife in the face. I could not go home and look my friends in the face. I could not go home and look for anybody that voted for me and look them in the face and say, oh yeah, you know old President Obama, he was terrible. Trillion dollar deficits as far as the eye could see. Oh, but the Republican deficits, they're not quite as bad because they're just a trillion dollars. See, that's what we're doing here. The Republican side is telling America trillion dollar deficits are bad when they're Democrats, but they're okay when they're Republicans. So they're telling you deficits are, you know, they're bad when the other guys do it, but they're not so bad when we do it. This is the height of hypocrisy. And this is sort of maybe the uncomfortableness that this debate engenders. And having this uncomfortableness is maybe why we don't want to have amendments. It's not, it's sort of backfiring because I'm going to talk about this for quite a while and we're going to vote at three in the morning because they wouldn't let me have a vote during the day and I probably won't get a vote, but I think it's sort of misguided. We should have had 20 votes. There are votes the Democrats wanted that I probably disagree with and probably would have voted no on, but I would have voted to let them have amendments. Well, this is a big deal. This is our, our, our spending. You know, this is what the Congress is supposed to do, is assess our spending and how much we do, and yet we're not going to have amendments to it. It's pre-decided by some secret cabal of leadership from both sides who have now clasped hands to say, we have won, the country has won, we now have a trillion dollar deficit this year. The American people are losing by this. And so I think we have to figure out a better way. We have to figure out a way where we do our job, which is each of the individual appropriation bills. We look and we scrutinize waste. We, we, I showed you some of the William Proxmire Golden Fleece Awards from 1968. And the same agency that's been wasting that money is still here. We haven't limited their budget. Their budget's probably tenfold bigger than it was in 1968. And we're still doing the crazy stuff. Actually, the last one, let's do the quail one. I can't resist. 
So here's a good one from the same, same group of people that brought you Neil Armstrong and $700,000 to study. What did he say? One small step for man or one small step for a man. These people, they, they won up even Neil Armstrong. They decided that they wanted to know, are Japanese quail more sexually promiscuous on cocaine? Inquiring minds want to know. And, and the thing is, is I think we could probably poll the audience. I wish there was a button at home we could ask people to just sort of dial in and push a button. Do you think Japanese quail are more sexually promiscuous on cocaine? We spent money. We spent $356,000 studying this. See, this is the kind of craziness. But why do we do this every year? Why doesn't it get any better? We don't look at it. So if you have a 700-page bill and nobody looks at it, how are you ever going to find this? Even in an appropriation bill, if we did an appropriation bill that included this, it would still be 500 pages long and you'd have to hunt long and hard to find this. Why don't we have conditions on how you spend your money? Because we don't look at it. Nobody reads any of these bills. Nobody, we don't do individual bills. People come to my office and they say, well, I'm for legal aid and I think people should uh, uh, be able to have a lawyer and poor people should get help. And I was like, you know, and I listen to them and I say, well, you know, I've never voted on that. You know, I probably will never vote on that. I won't even vote on the Department of Government that oversees legal aid because I'm given a 700-page bill that has all of the government spending. So what's, what's ironic about this is we have dozens and dozens of people who come to our office every day saying, we like this part of government. And I say, well, I never get to vote on it. So I, I don't know if I can help you or hurt you because I never get to vote on that part of government. They make me vote on all of the government. So it's either all or none. The binary choice is shut it down or keep it open, but don't reform it. I think it's a terrible choice. I did a hearing this week and I called it the terrible, rotten, no good way to run your government. And that's what I believe. It's a terrible, rotten, no good way to run your government. And we just shouldn't do it. And I'll tell you another, this is a secret, so don't tell anyone. But when I talk to people, I've talked to probably 50 senators in the last three weeks. And you know what most of them say? Well, we kind of agree with you. It's a really crummy way. This is the last time I'm voting for it. And uh, I say, well, didn't you tell me that last year? Didn't I hear that the year before? That was your last CR you're ever voting for? You're never going to vote for another one? You know what would happen? Let's say that this speech was so persuasive that all my colleagues came in here and got a conscience, and they all voted down this spending and said, hooey with all of you, we're going to not spend all that money. The government was shut down over the weekend. We'd come back on Monday and do our job, you know? And then we'd start looking at the spending individually. We'd start looking at each individual items, and we'd say, these are things we shouldn't spend it on. These are things we should. We'd begin that process. The other thing is, if you pass one appropriation bill, then you don't have to worry about that part. So once you pass the defense appropriation bill, that's more than one-twelfth of government. It's probably about a third of the government. You pass that, then you don't have to worry about that shutting down. So each time you pass an appropriation bill, you move on to another. But we have to do that. And I, I think the thing that's disappointing is so, uh, probably everybody in here, Republican and Democrat, will tell you, oh, where is a terrible way to run your government? And yet we're doing it. And we did it a week ago. And we did it three weeks ago. And we did it a month ago. This is the fourth time we've done it this year. Since I've been here, we have never passed all the appropriation bills. We've never had extended debate in committees. I was thinking about this the other day, and I was thinking, what if the first day you got sworn in, the leadership sat in the chair, and all 100 people were required to be here or requested strongly to be here, and we had a frank discussion, and we said to both sides, this is the year. I'm not doing any continuing resolutions, and guess what? It'll just shut down if we don't, but we're going to do our job, and in the first three months of the fiscal year, we're going to have hearings, and the main job of the hearings will be to both authorize and appropriate the money. Three months for each committee. That'd be a pretty long time, actually. And then maybe spend a whole week or two weeks in the committee with amendments, with specific things like, we've decided this year not to study what cocaine does for Japanese quail. So this would be the year we finally stop doing that. And you'd have that debate, and you'd have three months on committees, and then you'd have nine months left to do the spending bills. And then you'd say, if you were gathered and sitting in the chair, you'd say to everyone, this is the way we're going to do it. And then each appropriation bill, we're going to take three weeks on the floor to do them. Three weeks. We're not going to putter around, obfuscate, and not have any amendments until this is what we're doing. We're getting, you know, and the one reason we're going to send this over to the House at midnight is we're hoping they're too tired to vote no. So we're going to send it over late tonight, 
or three in the morning, maybe, when it's going to be sent over. But it's purposefully done. We don't do amendments. We don't do anything in a timely fashion. We wait around to the very end. In the very end, we're trying to wear people out so there isn't sufficient energy to really scrutinize your government and its spending. We've had all week. We could have done this. But let's say you did committee hearings for three months, and then for nine months, the rest of the fiscal year, you did your appropriation bills, and you spent two or three weeks on the floor, and you let people bring amendments. My first amendment would be bringing that the National Science Foundation is no longer able to do most of the stuff they do. And the only way you'd do this is you'd have to give them less money, maybe half as much, I don't know, 25 percent of what they get. I mean, a lot less, because they're, they're spending a lot of it on, on things they shouldn't be doing. But this goes throughout government. We have the same debate all the time. We had this debate with the post office. They were losing a billion dollars a quarter. That's quite a bit of money. And then they came before our committee and they said, well, we need to, we need to pay them sufficiently. You can't have good quality people unless you pay them. So they wanted to pay the top guy like a million, a million and a half. And I said, well, to keep talent, to keep quality, how much talent does it take to lose a billion dollars a quarter? It's like, I'll do it for less than that, but I can lose half a billion you know, for $500,000 a year. I mean, it's like, it's the ridiculous notion of government. And sometimes I wonder, I think, um, you know, is, are the people in government, or is government inherently stupid or populated by people who are inherently stupid? And I don't think so. I think there are well-meaning people in government. So they're not inherently stupid, but they don't get any of the right and proper incentives. And so think about it in your life. If you were to, if I were to ask you for $10,000 each, and I say, I've got this business proposition, will you give me $10,000? Were you going to think long and hard about what you had to do to get the $10,000? And if you give it to me, you're probably going to have a little pang inside, hoping you get it back and hoping I pay dividends to you and you get your money back. But it's a really a heartfelt decision. It doesn't make it always the right decision, but it's a heartfelt decision, and it, you really, really struggle with every fiber of your being to make sure you made the right choice, even though it's not always going to be right. In government, imagine your city council person, 10000 bucks. It's not their money. And then imagine that you go to state legislature, and it's not $10,000, it's uh, $2 million. Then imagine you get up here, and it's now $2 billion or maybe $200 billion. It's not their money. And so when you look at government, you say, why is government so bad? Milton Friedman hit the nail on the head. Milton Friedman said, nobody spends somebody else's money as wisely as their own. That, that's the truth of it. And that's the way government is. So government will never be efficient because of the very nature of government. It's not an argument for no government, but it's an argument for minimizing how big government is. Government should never be involved in something that somebody else is already doing or that the private sector can do because government will never be as, as efficient because nobody spends somebody else's money as wisely as their own until we recognize that, which actually goes hand in hand with what the founders thought. The founders thought that people ought to be left free to do most of the things themselves, and so they very significantly limited what the federal government was supposed to do. So as we move forward in this debate, and as we look at what can be done to bring back the greatness of this country, I think we do have to be worried about the debt we're accumulating. And my hope is that both sides of the aisle will, will look long and hard and say, this isn't the way I, we should run our government. And not just say this and say next time, but maybe say this time. Because I promise you, both sides of the aisle have told me this this week. It's a terrible way to run government. Oh, you're exactly right. Continuing resolutions, putting all the spending in one bill and not reading it and having no analysis and not getting rid of the waste is a terrible way to run a government. But almost everybody who told me that this week is going to vote for it. So the only way this ever gets fixed is you've got to call these people and convince them that they need to do their job, which is do the individual appropriation bills. They need to pay attention to the Constitution, or frankly, you need new people. And so that's what the American people have decided. Do you need new people, or are you happy with them borrowing a trillion dollars? I think it's completely and utterly irresponsible, and I think it's something that no American family would do. I don't care whether you're a, a Democrat or Republican or independent. No American family lives the way your government does. It's completely and utterly irresponsible. So as we look at this debate, my hope is that both sides will come together and say, enough's enough. This is the time. Tonight, I say no. Thank you, Mr. President.
The Assistant Democratic Leader. Are we in a quorum call? We are not. Mr. President, um, I come to the floor today, as I have over the past few months, uh, urging the United States Senate to come together in a bipartisan fashion 